Uh, so you start in the early history. All right, in the late 60s, early 70s, 49 of the 50 states prohibited consensual sodomy in one form or another. According to the American Psychiatric Association, being homosexual was a mental illness. There was no such thing as an anti-discrimination law that covered gay people anywhere in the country. And we were subject to gay bashing, which in those days didn't mean some politician was saying something unkind about you. It meant you were getting the hell beaten out of you. Gotcha. Stop, stop there for a minute? Stop there. Okay. Under the Alcoholic Beverage Control Law of the state of the North, it was impermissible for homosexuals to congregate in a bar. And the police, using that as an excuse, used to raid gay bars regularly. And usually there was no resistance whatsoever uh, by the patrons to this activity until the patrons of Stonewall had finally had enough being shoved around, and so when the police came in, for no reason other than they felt like it, um, there was resistance, and eventually it turned into a full-fledged riot, which lasted three days, I think, before the police finally got them under control, which resulted in the Lindsay administration uh, which was in charge of the city at the time, basically uh, telling the police to knock it off. To stop raiding the guard. Yes. And another police tactic at the time was to go to a gay congregation place, like a bar, have an attractive young man who would stand at the bar until some patron came up and suggested they go home together, at which point the fellow would who made the suggestion would be arrested. And uh, this happened from time to time. And eventually, whether it was a raid or whether it was a solicitation, I don't remember. Uh, one victim of this type of behavior, who was an illegal immigrant, was so afraid of being deported after being arrested that he threw himself out of the side of second story window and impaled himself on a fence below. And the outrage over this incident was so great that the mayor said that there were to be no more solicitation arrests by the police. Was this before Stonewall or after? It was a, Around I, I remember it as being about simultaneous. Okay. I don't know. Mm -hmm. okay. So when was the first gay pride parade? Uh, 1970. It was a bit the following year. A Stonewall. year after Stonewall. Yes. And then when did the laws start to change in New York City, New York State? Well, uh, anti-discrimination laws were passed in the city in the uh, mid to late 80s uh, after I think about a 16-year campaign. Um, I don't remember when the state adopted the anti-discrimination law. In fact, to tell you the truth, I don't even remember if they have. But, but you know, we in New York have been protected for since the 80s. Okay. Now, sodomy laws. Explain, explain what a sodomy law is and when they started to change. Well, that's more difficult than one might think because the sodomy laws weren't the same. Some states, it regulated uh, contact uh, between same sex only. Some states, it regulated contact between men and women as well as same sex contact. Uh, in some states, the prohibition extended to the marital relationship. In some states, it didn't. In some states, it was defined with great specificity. In, in other words, it 
laid out exactly what acts were covered, and presumably what acts were not covered since they were omitted. In other states, you had very vague prohibitions, such as the prohibition against the crime of what, which no Christian man dare speak. Well, the Christian men I know speak about quite a lot, so I'm not exactly sure what they were aiming at there. And you had, uh, I remember one judge who was wrestling with the term crime against nature, and is reported to have said, I'm not exactly sure what the crime against nature is, but apparently it doesn't involve walking on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's move from there. Stonewall, maybe a little before. There had been an organization called the Gay Liberation Front. And the problem with the Gay Liberation Front is that uh, civil rights for gay people was just a portion of their agenda. And they were basically in favor of uh, a laundry list of uh, what would be called liberal or left-wing uh, items. Now, when you're that diffuse, uh, what happens is the people who agree with part of your agenda and don't agree with another part of your agenda drift away. So, the Gay Activist Alliance came into existence, which had a single focus, which was civil rights for lesbians and gay men. And they acquired a old firehouse in Soho, and they used it to have weekly dances for which they charged admission. And they were so popular, and the venue was so large, that they had a working budget. And they became famous by having essentially very noisy, obstreperous sit-ins uh, where politicians were gathered. And sometimes they extended to other venues. Right? As I recall, the Daily News printed some anti-gay editorial and they had a demonstration inside their press room. But Mostly it was to make the mayor's life a living hell if they could. And, um, and this organization was called? The Gay Activist Alliance. Okay. And as one of their innumerable committees, they had a legal committee. To give you some sense of the times, it was headed by a law student at Fordham who used uh, an assumed name because he was afraid if anybody found out that he was involved in this cause, he would be barred from becoming a lawyer. And, uh, this is an important point. Stop for a second. In the late 60s, early 70s, if you were uh, a graduating law student uh, looking to be employed in a law firm or in a corporation or in a government agency, if you were openly gay, the chances of you being hired were close to zero. It's good enough. Hold for a second. While I was uh, a member of the legal committee of the Gay Actors Alliance, I came up with the idea that there should be a legal defense and education fund for lesbians and gay men. And so in 1971, I started the process for bringing that into existence. At the time, there were a lot of red tape rules, one of which, as I recall, required that you list three incorporators, so I listed myself, and two other uh, lawyers who I was acquainted with, Terry Bogan and Michael Lavery, uh, as the uh, requisite three on the Certificate of Incorporation. Okay. And you were denied and then you were... So take us through the process. You were denied and then you were permitted. After uh, I had taken it to 
the Bar Association, you know, the State Department of Education, anybody else that you were required to run your papers by, I submitted them to the Appellate Division First Department, which was a prerequisite to submitting your incorporation papers to the New York State Secretary of State. And they disapproved the petition for incorporation, even though my papers were an exact duplicate of the most recent similar type of corp uh, corporation which they had approved. And basically they seemed to think that uh, gay people didn't need this kind of corporation. Uh, at that time, uh, a law firm called Rabinowitz, Boudin, and Standard was litigating the constitutionality of the statutory scheme for these corporations with regard to others. Uh, uh, an associate at that firm asked to see my papers because he thought that uh, my being turned down might help in their case. I showed him what I had done and asked if his firm would take an appeal in my case on a pro bono basis. And they agreed and uh, the denial was overturned in the New York State Court of Appeal. In 1973? In 1973. Well, maybe 72 or 73 because the decision of the Court of Appeals was to send it back to the appellate division, mm -hmm. which in 1973 uh, gave their approval after striking out one uh, paragraph right. of the corporation papers. And so in October of 1973, the papers having been submitted to the New York State Secretary of State and accepted by that office, <coughs> Lambda came into existence for these corporations at the time was that a certain percentage of the board be lawyers admitted in the state of New York. Now, I didn't want to initially deal with any possibility that we would run afoul of not meeting this minimum, so I, I initially decided that all the board members would be lawyers admitted in New York. Um, which would obviously take care of the problem. And the first board consisted of Bill Tom, Terry Bogan, Shepard Ramey, Michael Lavery, Nick Riso, and Rodney Eubanks. Uh, the only lesbian lawyer I was personally acquainted with at the time, I had asked, but she had declined. But we always had as a, a goal uh, having female members on the board and fairly early on uh, we made an official policy that 50% of the board members should be female as an aspiration uh, and uh, when I had been president for five years had decided not to stand for a six one-year term, uh, my immediate successor was Marco Carl, who was the first female president of the board. The end. Early Lambda uh, associates were Nath Rockhill, who I had known through the Gay Activist Alliance, and it was very prominent uh, in that organization. Uh, uh, Barbara Levy, uh, Roz Richter uh, became uh, an executive director uh, and is now uh, an appellate division justice of New York State. And of course, Marco Carl, I mentioned. Uh, okay. So we had a, a, a female presence uh, relatively early on. 